Listeners, if you thought the topic of blacklisting had been exhausted, then know that there's at least one stone that had remained unturned until recently. And that is the impact that blacklisting had on the budding TV industry, particularly the careers of women. This season of Advanced TV Herstory, four episodes in all, includes segments of an extended interview with Dr. Carol Stabile of the University of Oregon and mentions dozens of names of women you've never heard of. You'll also hear from another author and scholar, Dr. Charlene Register of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I am grateful to her for our frank conversation about how racism further changed the course of early TV. You won't find this anywhere else. This is Advanced TV Herstory, and I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. In earlier episodes, Dr. Stabile walked us through the blacklist, not only as we know it from our history classes, movies, and books, but also explaining the origin of toxic masculinity and how it sought out and ruined progressive women who were on the cusp of transitioning careers in film and stage and radio to TV. Then she and I talked about how TV in the 50s would have looked had these careers taken hold on this emerging platform. From allegations to suppressed pain, 41 women suffered their entire lives following the 1950 publication of Red Channels. Now, mind you, this is a publication that basically had very little fact, very little substantiation that any of these women, that any of the people, actually men or women in the document, had any communist connections that could have done harm or damage to the United States. So how could a few former FBI agents who had information, or so they claimed, and a printing press, intimidate and coerce and blackmail not just the broadcasting industry itself, TV, Hollywood, radio, but also the very ad agencies and sponsors who fueled it? We pick up the conversation with Dr. Stabile. This is not by accident. This was very intentional, and it had a lot to do with power, and behind the power was money. So that gets us to the power that the, that the advertising industry had. That was, that was part of this. The FBI and these G-men, these guys who had their business, they kind of had gotten to a point where they had the advertisers fearing. They didn't know what to think, Right. Yeah, it's interesting to read through the FBI files because I think that there's been a common, a kind of common sense that the blacklist was embraced by the industry as well. And that really, the, the FBI documents paint a very different picture. It shows that networks were not happy with this. Advertisers were not happy with this because they thought that the blacklist, and, it, and they were right in thinking so, was going to cost them millions of dollars. These were really talented people who were listed in red channels, they were they were making a lot of money for networks, and they had no reason to want to fire them. They didn't think they were communists. I mean, maybe some of them were annoying insofar as they were union activists and kind of burrs under their saddle. But again, they had no reason to want to rid the industry of people who were writing and producing and directing really popular shows like Gangbusters or you know, this is your FBI or programs like that. So it took a lot of convincing to get them to a place where they were so fearful of retaliation by the the Federal Bureau of, Investiga- of Investigation that they finally fell in line. And it took, it took several years for that to happen. And falling in line meant subscribing to this goofy newsletter and basically bending over backwards to do due diligence with manufactured evidence that, that then created the argument to get rid of the person or in the case of some of these women literally turn them out on a dime and that's that's the amazing part okay oh just one thing on a missed opportunities um and that's theater right the thing about production being in new york city is that it was the proximity to theater that was such a source of innovation and creative energy and so i think more so than film that's one of the collaborations and one of the avenues that really got shut down i mean of course there were anthology throughout the 1950s until the era of the anthologies were, were over. But there was so much innovation and, you know, really dynamic writing and content um, being produced in, in theater 
that could have made its way into television, but was fr- prevented from doing so by the blacklist. To to the point of, for example, like there would be like GE Playhouse on a, on a Sunday night or a Saturday night, there might be some very high caliber, you know, we think of Twilight Zone, but that kind of caliber drama right. that was born out of either, you know, uh, off-Broadway or Broadway, mm-hmm. a lot of crossover, a lot of live entertainment that, that could have and should have been developed. Yeah, you're right. The, the yeah. cost of opportunity just makes me sad. The Broadcast 41 then, again, is... Um, a subset of a larger list that appeared in a document called Red Channels. Is that right? That's right. And so this is 41 women who range in age from, well, having been born toward the end of the 19th century, you know, like 1893 was Dorothy Parker, one of the older ones. Yep. And Judy Holliday having been born in 1921. Right. Uh, and she really was well known for having been blacklisted. Mm-hmm. So there is these broadcast 41, just kind of organizing all the menus here. Then there was the Hollywood 10, which were the most prominent only writers, writers and directors. They were writers, directors and producers. Yeah. And then there was a whole other bucket of people who got sent through the ringer. How do you track those down? Is that a separate list? Um, Red Channels listed 151 people working in television. But then the advertising agents and later agencies in the networks then developed their own lists which were much more extensive. So by 51, 52, you're looking at this proliferation of lists of people who could no longer be hired in television without fear of of a backlash. There were also Senate committees like the McClellan Committee in California and the Tenney Committee. Um, No, McClellan was New York and the Tenney Committee was was in, in, in Hollywood that were producing their own lists and their own information. They were calling people and demanding that they name the names of other people who were members of the Communist Party or fellow travelers. So it really was this whole proliferation of lists, some of which are still hidden behind corporate archives, right? So we don't know who CBS had on their list. Cynthia Meyer has done a lot of research on some of the advertising agencies, so has actually read their lists Mm -hmm. and see how those lists expanded over time. Wow. At a time in American life when things appear to have been going well, right? That's what the history books tell us, that housing was going up in the suburbs and that there were cars and garages and that medicine and inventions were changing our lives that in fact this was a time of intimidation, and that changed history and her story. For these women, it may not have been apparent when Red Channels was published there in 1950, wake up and, oh my gosh, I'm listed on this thing. They maybe didn't realize that their lives and their careers would be damaged or ended. Maybe they figured it was a small setback, but that their reputation for good work would carry them, that we would go back to recognizing and rewarding effort and intelligence and cleverness in entertainment. They maybe didn't think that so many others would become complicit in this, that they would be intimidated as well. I asked Dr. Stabile about some of the more poignant moments of conducting this research, of reading FBI files, and for many of them, perhaps she was the first non-FBI employee to read them, and perhaps was the first woman to ever read them. So some of the most poignant moments, it's hard to know where to start. Certainly reading declassified FBI files had many surprising moments. Reading through pianist Ray Lev's files, I mentioned this before, but just to recap, the FBI began surveilling Ray after Red Channels was published. She was a classically trained pianist and progressive who'd worked with a range of civil rights organizations. She said that as a minority herself, she had an obligation to fight for civil rights for all minorities. For nearly 20 years, the Bureau went through her trash, monitored her travel, prevented her from getting a passport so she could perform in Europe. Um, And reading this file gave me a deep sense of how ruinous the Red Scare was for people. The last entry in the file was a detailed account of Lev's suicide in 1967 and a note that the file could now be closed. Shirley Graham's archive at the Schlesinger was another moment for me. There are thousands of pages of her incredible creative output. 
but also so much documentation of the impact of white supremacy on her everyday life and career, from the many times she lost jobs because of anti-communist activism to correspondence about the death of her elder son who was denied medical treatment at a segregated hospital during World War II. The personal archives of these women were in, were just amazing. Brilliant Gypsy Rose Lee through her letters, mystery novels, drafts of the play Gypsy and other writings. As I mentioned before, many of these women wrote memoirs that were never published, which gives such insight into their lives and struggles, as well as to the work they wanted to do before the, the blacklist took place. The other thing that was, I, I guess, not surprising, um, but certainly illuminating to me were the, the funny creative networking among these and other progressive women. Eleanor Roosevelt sent Gypsy Rose Lee a telegram when Gypsy premiered in 1959 that just said, may your bare ass always be shining. Um, there's lots of evidence of all the ways in which their careers and lives interacted and overlapped. Another moment for me was um, an interview with Jean Muir's daughter uh, in just the sense that even so many years after the blacklist, this was such a difficult topic for her to talk about. She said that her father always thought her mother was a member of the Communist Party. My research showed that Muir was identified as a member of the Communist Party because of a transcription error on the part of the FBI. But I think that Muir's husband died thinking she had been a member of the Communist Party. The other moment was really incredible for me was um, I had a conversation with Jean Muir's granddaughter, who coincidentally was an undergraduate at the University of Oregon. Um, she came to see me shortly after the 2016 election um, because she wanted to know what her grandmother had been fighting for and what had happened to her. Wow. And it was this it was this really intense moment where I thought about the convergence of those two times. I thought about the misogyny and backlash that Jean Muir and other people had been experiencing in a moment that felt very similar. I mean, I know it wasn't similar. I'm a historian, but it, and just being able to share it with her granddaughter it also gave me a sense of, of how important these stories are and how important these forms of storytelling are for her generation and generations to come and how meaningful they might be. Listeners, Jean Muir had a real career in Hollywood and had signed a contract to be in a new TV series, The Aldrich Family, when Red Channels landed on everyone's desk in 1950. Muir was immediately released from that signed contract Read more about the whole story in Dr. Stabile's book because she has read through Muir's documents and her diaries and her letters and really does the whole story justice. And it really is a tragedy. Young women asking questions, a gap analyst baby boomer like Dr. Stabile asking questions. Just last fall, when TV series creator of shows like Designing Women, Linda Bloodworth Thomason, mustered her courage to speak up and wrote a column for the New York Times. She spoke up about serial misogynist CBS executive Les Moonves. And that one piece of writing helped answer questions that I had been asking myself for a long time. Where is Linda? Why isn't she even on social media? Well, in fact, she had vanished because in the mid-1990s, network head Moonves had assured her that she would never work in TV again. He didn't want her there. He didn't want her shows. He didn't want her projecting progressive ideas. So it's not surprising that 40 years earlier, before, you know, while Linda Bloodworth Thomason was kicking out designing women and lots of other shows, and no doubt serving as a role model for other women, 40 years earlier, other women had vanished, at least for a time. Okay, so again, activism in uh, the unions brought us to Rose Hobart, who also was with the Screen Actors Guild. She was 44 when Red Channels was, was published, lived to, um, to almost be 100 years old. She had been on the stage. She had gone to Hollywood. And it seems as though she was included in Red Channels only because she had work at, talked openly about working conditions yeah. in Hollywood. You know, the thing that became clear to me after I finished the book was the extent to which the attack 
on progressives was also an attack on the unions that were representing them. Rose Hobart had long been a union activist in Hollywood. And as you said, she was, you know, she's one of the first group of, of women who was agitating about working conditions. You know, the hours were terrible for women. It was really being on sets was just an awful experience. And so I think that, again, she was just an easy target because of that. She had also, not coincidentally, um, just had a baby. So she had a baby, I think, at the age of 43. Um, so she was, and she got married um, after she had the baby, I think, to, to kind of see if she couldn't save her career that way. Um, so, yeah, I think you're right it, that it was, her, it was her, her labor activism that brought her to the attention of anti-communists, and she just got caught up in the web. Mm-hmm. Now, listeners, here's a here's the exercise. You know, do a Wikipedia search or a IMDb search of Rose Hobart, and what you find is, oh, here is a woman who had occasional cameos on various series through the '60s, like one one episode of this series and one episode of that series, and you think. What was she before she was doing this? Well, in fact, she was something significant and ended up having to take about a 10-year hiatus from her career to rehabilitate her reputation, hope that people had forgotten, hope that there was such demand for somebody to, to be, uh, you know, position uh, roles to be cast for. By this wholesale elimination of women of that age, then even the series that we saw in the 60s there just weren't that many roles because there weren't that many women standing around tapping their fingers on the table saying, make a role for me, make a role for me. In the second episode of this season of Advanced TV History, I alluded to some YouTube video of broadcast 41-er Madeline Lee Guilford, which was an interview her son conducted with her in 2006. While they talked of the blacklist, she only referenced the impact it had on her husband's career. That's kind of amazing, considering how it changed hers. Madeline Lee Guilford and Jack Guilford were rabble rousers. They were activists. They showed up at things. They organized things. They were um, visible. And Jerome Robbins, very accomplished choreographer, is called upon to testify at the House on American Activities Committee and is asked to name names. And you know, it's, it's an ethical thing. It's a, it's a point of character and leadership and, and your values. If you're asked to name a name, you can either do it and save your, save your hide a little bit and diminish your sentence, or you can name the name. So mm-hmm. hold the name or name the name. And Jerome Robbins, even though he's being celebrated for all the, of his contributions, named the name. And as a result... Madeline Lee, who, oh, you know, kind of went on to do a little bit of theater and a little bit of TV, but still, very talented woman whose Mm -hmm. career was cut short at the age of 27. Yeah, she was 27, the mother of um, three children, I think, under the age of five. She was best known for doing a lot of voice acting, even at the time. The FBI derisively referred to her as the woman who made baby sounds on television. So Madeline Lee testified before HUAC. She testified at uh, the New York version of HUAC, and she was a fighter, Mm -hmm. and she would not back down. She named what was going on. She knew that it was the FBI, and she actually knew that FBI agents were, were stationed outside her home because she would greet them every day when she took her kids out to the park. But she was, she was spirited. She didn't back down, and she did not name names. And I think you're right. That's really, really important. I mean, it wasn't just we say naming names as if it's like you just told people's names, but people were informing on other people understanding that the consequences were their careers. Mm-hmm. And so you have to ask yourself, would you do it, right? If you knew, if I knew, Cynthia, mm-hmm. right, that mm-hmm. I had information that if I shared it, it would mean that you never worked again in the business that you loved and in the profession that you treasured, would I do that? Well, and to that end, would you be more likely to not name the name of a man because his career was more important because he was yeah. the breadwinner in a family, but you could name a woman because she was a little further down the food chain and her career was a little bit more expendable. 
Yeah, I think that people created all different kinds of reasons for why they should name names, right? They could say, oh, well, someone was already named or, you know, everyone knows that this person was a member of the Communist Party. So I think people created um, really elaborate excuses for that behavior. But very few of these women, um, the women listed in red channels, actually name names, mm. even yeah. though it cost them their careers. Mm -hmm. Naming names, telling stories, making stuff up about people. In a 1973 interview with Dick Cavett while promoting her book, Pentimento, Lillian Hellman, who was one of the women on the Broadcast 41 list, you have to find this clip on YouTube. I'll put the link in the show notes. Lillian, she just seemed disgusted by how people positioned themselves in that era. Mind you, this is a woman of vast credentials as a playwright, as an intellectual, as an author, raconteur. And there she's sitting there, having been really called by so many people a liar and a communist and every name in the book. And she strained not to go into greater detail with Dick Cavett in 1973 that she held her tongue. She shared her opinion a little bit, and she claimed that there were so many who simply fabricated whatever story was necessary to satisfy the body, the committee, the task force that was investigating them and their circle. In her later years and after her death, Lillian Hellman, one of the Broadcast 41, who was this noted author and playwright and screenwriter and thinker, she was called a liar. Yet even in the 1973 interview, she declines to share too many details. She doesn't really connect dots, and she doesn't make bold statements for her talk show host. She does not take the bait. This underscores, it feels to me, Dr. Stabile's observations about just how provocative and detailed and rich archives can be. By even hunting down and telling their stories, you're modeling how important it is to keep, keep asking questions, keep asking questions of the older women in the room about what life was like, about what's in that box in grandma's basement, because you never know whose diaries they are. You know, some of these women gave their papers to somebody else for safekeeping. Photos, diaries, gave things away. And that's where the work that we're doing today in disparate ways of research and book writing and podcasting still comes together to bring us aligned in, in resistance and in persistence. The book on feminism has by no means been written and in fact is only starting to get filled in today as we're all able to connect. Yeah, and I think there's also something about, um, about the way that power works that as long as they can say, oh, really? Sexual harassment is a problem? We didn't know. You know, as long as they can keep saying that to successive generations of people who are resisting and opposing, as long as we don't have the memory that, no, this isn't the first time. This is not the first time that women have complained about working conditions and equity in Hollywood. This isn't the first time, I mean, to think about the movement for black lives, right? Mm -hmm. That, that African Americans have organized and mobilized against, um, against racial violence. As long as they can keep pretending that somehow, oh, we just didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel like that allows power to reproduce itself. Mm -hmm in ways that deny a history and a memory to the resistance. TV historians Carol Stabile has published a book, The Broadcast 41, Women in the Com Anti-Communist Blacklist. If you think you've read the book because you've just listened to these episodes of Advanced TV History, let me tell you, you haven't. We've just touched the high points and the points that you as a listener who are just maybe mildly interested in this part of American history, maybe now you are really super interested because you realize that it fills in pieces of questions you didn't even know you had. And you heard a lot of names of very talented women. Um, she, ex she does a great justice to those women in the book and it will uh, seed you with enough information about where to get more information about these great women because it's all based on fact. It's all based on writings that have preceded all of us what a fantastic conversation. My many thanks to this smart lady who sees gaps and keeps asking questions until they are answered. Listeners, I encourage you to follow Carol Stabile on Twitter at C-A-S-T-A-B-I-L-E and learn more about her book, including where to buy it, at her website, 
which is broadcast41.com. At that site, you'll see your book buying options and which independent sellers will sell online and mail it to you. And this is another chance to make a difference in the, in the lives of small businesses or smaller businesses than the big ones out there. Before I close out this episode with a clip from former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, because you know what? I plumb ran out of vintage audio that was appropriate and applicable to this whole conversation of the Broadcast 41. There's no other video out there. There's very little audio that is relevant. I want to acknowledge the editing and creative graphics work of Catherine Yang. The theme music to this show has always been Take Me Higher by Jazzer, and that's found at freemusicarchive.org. And I assure you all that the show notes and our website, tvherstory.com, will contain the links and the book titles to everything we've mentioned. And there you'll also find our social media handles and old episodes and ways to contact and support this show. Thank you so much for listening to this very important, relevant information. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. And now I turn it over to the former First Lady herself, Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, Mrs. Roosevelt, this is uh, you have been become known as the leader of what is loosely called the liberal movement in this country, or what used to be called the liberal movement in this country, and some people call them do-gooders and the rest of it. Could you define a liberal for us? I mean, uh, yeah, in your own words. It's very hard to put in a few words what a liberal is, but I would feel that a liberal was a person who kept an open mind, was willing to meet new questions with new solutions and felt that you could move forward. You didn't have to always look backwards and be afraid of moving forward. 